you can find Isaiah and then Jeremiah. It's one of the larger books there in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter number 20. I want to read two verses to you tonight, or three verses, and give you the thought that the Lord showed me the other day from this passage. I think it'll be helpful to us. Also, I'll say, uh, if you missed the morning message, uh, I, and it's not, because, don't, it's not because of the messenger, but because of the message, I think it was timely, uh, and I think it would help many people, not because of the message, but because of the Bible that it came from, I would go on and watch it or listen to it or recommend it uh, to someone that was not here. Uh, maybe somebody that's struggling uh, with uh, uh, some things in their life when it comes to Christianity. Uh, and so this message will sort of uh, almost be a part B to that uh, sermon from this morning. And we'll uh, see, uh, we, we, we answered this question. Uh, we were looking uh, in the Bible and we uh, looked at a passage of Scripture in the book of Galatians and he said, uh, who uh, hath hindered you? Uh, you used to be in the race and you're not in the race anymore. And uh, we answered this question, who is the who in your life? Who is the who? Do you remember if you were in the service this morning, I want everyone uh, to sort of say it, uh, out loud, do you remember what the conclusion? Who is the who that hinders you in the work of the ministry? Who is it? You. The who is you. The who is you. Uh, and, uh, and we learned that this morning on the pages uh, of Holy Scripture. We want to blame everybody. Uh, we want to blame everybody for our problems and everybody for the reason why we're not doing anything for God. Everybody, while we're a disgruntled church member, and the, and the reality is that Paul told the church that uh, at Galatia there that the fault lies with you. No one can take you out of the race unless you want to get taken out of the race. All right, nobody can sideline you. You sideline yourself. Stop blaming everybody else and start taking responsibility. We got an entire nation and, and, and we're now moving into the second and third generation of individuals that want to blame everybody for their problems, Brother Jeff, instead of taking responsibility. The nation is a mess tonight, not because of the president. The nation's a mess tonight because of the people. The nation's a mess tonight because of the Christians. And we dropped the ball a long time ago. We want to place blame in Washington and this, that, and the other thing. And, and uh, we only got what we had coming to us. Maybe if we take responsibility for ourselves, it would cause us to do something. Uh, and maybe we could change something. But as long as we want to throw the blame around on everybody else, ain't nothing going to ever change. Church ain't ever going to change. Your Christian walk ain't ever going to change. You're going to be the same dried up old stale Christian you've always been. You're never going to do anything for God. You can spin your wheels and throw all the mud that you want to while spinning your wheels. But that, just because you're spinning your wheels doesn't mean you're moving. You're sitting still. You say, well, I'm in the work of the ministry. Doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. A lot of people are in the work of the ministry. It's easy to go through the motions. It's easy. It's easy to go through the motions. We need to take responsibility for why we are the way that we are and why we're not doing anything for the cause of Christ. Stop blaming everybody uh, about, uh, uh, in the world. This my preacher and this preacher and that person and this Christian, my word. It's all right. Uh, it's our fault. And, uh, and so, uh, and so uh, get back in the race. We encourage you to get back in the race. Uh, we have to run our own race and stop running everybody else's race. And so tonight we're going to see a fella that ran a race. But while he was running the race, somebody came into his lane, tried to knock him out. We talked about some of those people this morning in the service. I want you to see this individual, Jeremiah chapter number 20. Look at verse number 7 with me. Jeremiah 20, verse number 7. Look at this. The prophet Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, is going to make this statement, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily, everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, 
and I could not stay. I want you to go with me, look at verse number 9, and in the middle of that verse, and uh, nearing the end of the verse, uh, I want you to see the phrase, His word was in mine heart as a burning fire. Now, I won't have time tonight to take you, and I was hoping we would be here in Sunday school, and this would go well with that, but that's all right. Come next week for Sunday school, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, this story in the Bible. But I have entitled the message, No Strange Fire Here. No Strange Fire Here. He said, Thy word, thy word, his word was in mine heart as a burning fire. If we had time tonight, we'd go back to the Old Testament book of Numbers and and we would hear a story about some fellas that offered strange fire before the Lord and God took them out. Because it wasn't God's fire, it was strange fire. God didn't want to have anything to do with that. And they were against Moses and all. And, and it's an interesting story. But it's talking about strange fire. But Jeremiah is not talking about strange fire. He's talking about real fire. What caused that real fire is what I want us to see tonight. So no strange fire here. Father, help me. Lord, uh, I pray that I'd be a blessing and a help to someone in the room. Lord, maybe someone that would watch it later on. I know many folks that do not attend here. Some don't even live anywhere near here, and they watch the message by way of the Internet. We thank the Lord for that. And I pray we'd be a help to them if uh, we can't be a help anywhere else. But take the message, and with the Spirit's power, I'm yielded to you the best that I know how. I need thy help. I cannot preach this book without thy help. And so take it now and help me to stay true to the text and present it in a way that is honoring and glorifying to you the way you would if you were here. And may we be encouraged, challenged, rebuked, reproved, whatever needs to be tonight. Something is represented in this room. We thank you for these that are here, asking for thy blessing in the few moments we have together. In Jesus' precious name, we'll ask all of these things. Amen and amen. You may be seated. There's not a whole lot of introduction, but the introduction is really... Uh, the several verses that lead up to uh, this passage in which I uh, read to you. Now, what you will have, and I will give you a uh, somewhat not completely in-depth background into the life of Jeremiah, but it, it'll help you to understand where we come to this text here. If you'll, come to verse, if you'll go to verse number one with me, please, let's look at what verse number one said. Now, Pasher, the son of uh, Immer, the priest, who is also chief governor in the house of the Lord, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. The first thing I want you to see from this passage of Scripture is I want you to see the sermon. The sermon. What is the sermon? If you would study the book of Jeremiah, you would find that he has been proclaiming God's message for 18 chapters up to this point. Now understand this. The book of Jeremiah is not laid out in somewhat of a chronological order where you can start in chapter number one and follow it through. Uh, but for sake of argument tonight, uh, uh, Jeremiah, and I'll give you some of the background and how far that we have come in history uh, to this portion of Scripture. But Jeremiah, for sake of argument, we're in chapter 20. Chapter number one was his call. Chapter number two was him giving his commission uh, from God. And you would find from there to this chapter that Jeremiah has been preaching to the wayward nation of Israel. Now, they've not been wayward through all of that. They had been wayward. They've had some bad kings, and uh, there's been one or two good kings, and there's actually a good king at this point. Many believe uh, Jeremiah to be about 21 years old when God calls him to stand and preach as a prophet. You would find in the uh, first chapter of the book of Jeremiah that he would talk about being a young man and saying, I cannot go and talk to others. Uh, uh, and God would say to him, don't worry about that. I will take care of you. And so he's a young man uh, here, many believe to be about 21, and he's called upon to preach and to prophesy. Josiah is the great king. Probably one of the greatest kings next to King David uh, and Solomon, of course, in all of his glory, even though he had some issues. But David being the greatest king and Solomon coming on the heels of that and, and uh, Hezekiah was an all right king. He had a few issues, but uh, Josiah was a good king. They've gone through a lot of bad kings, and Josiah, who was prophesied about 300 years before jo Josiah comes on the scene, uh, it is prophesied that there would come one that would restore uh, the right kind of worship and the Passover, and Josiah would be that man. 
at the point in which uh, you come uh, to the life of Jeremiah, you would find that Josiah and him are probably very similar in age. Josiah has come to the throne at the tender age of eight and has been made king. Eight years old, he's the king over a nation. And within a few short years of that, you would find that uh, he begins to live for the Lord. And that's for all the teenagers. It doesn't matter uh, whether or not you're 8 or 80, you can live for the Lord. You don't have to be a king uh, or a prince or anything else. If the king, Josiah, who came from some bad kings and saw some wickedness, can say in his heart, I'm going to live for the Lord, we can do it in the day and age in which we live, don't you think? And so Josiah, they say, is probably the same age as Jeremiah. They would be very close. And he has been king when Jeremiah comes on the scene for about 12 or 13 years. He would die 26 years later. Interesting thing I did not know about Josiah. I should know this, but I did not. Josiah died when he was 39 years old. I thought Josiah lived to be a, 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 a long-standing king, but he came on the throne at eight years old, and if you'll read the Bible, you would find how long that he was king. It only maps out to be about 39 years. He went into battle when he shouldn't have gone into battle. He was killed, or he was shot at, and he was brought back, and he died uh, as a result of injuries from that battle. And a, a new king would come on the scene uh, and for three months, Jehoahaz. He's taken captive. Jeremiah, uh, at that time, so are you with me? Him and uh, Jeremiah comes on the scene, he's about 21, all right? Josiah is about 21. This is the prophet to the king. Uh, I, he would prophesy to the nation of Israel, and now things are going well for the nation of Israel. Uh, Josiah is a good king. He has reinstituted the temple worship and the Passover, and things are going well. But yet God still had a message for the nation of Israel. And that message was they're going the wrong direction and, uh, and they better turn and they better repent. It's the same message he has for America. They better turn. I, I mean, I was your God and uh, you did worship me, but you have gone the wrong direction. You have started to worship everything but me. It's the same problem we're suffering with in America. I find, I said to my wife this week, people worship everything but God. As a matter of fact, I think I said this to her. Uh, I said, concerning a certain situation, I said, people have made absolutely everything a priority except for God. They have made children a priority. They will ditch out on God uh, to go do this or do that. I mean, uh, we have made our children a priority, our job a priority, our house a priority, our this or that. We have made everything a priority, and God comes last. If I have time, I'll squeeze God in. I'm sure he really appreciates getting squeezed into your life. But I, the last night, somebody needs to say amen tonight. Are you tired? Are you asleep? Wake up. Wake up. Sunday night church. Wake up. It's all right. Now, either that or I'm upsetting you tonight with the preaching, uh, and that's not my intent by 49%, but 51% of my intent is to upset you. Uh, but honestly, uh, this, is, this is where we've come in Christianity, and we wonder why our nation's in a mess, and we wonder why the man of God, uh, many, many, many men of God would stand today and try to help God's people, try to point them back to the right thing, and yet people don't listen. Why? We have prioritized everything but God, and God takes second place. God ought not to have second place in your life. God ought to have first place in your life. If you put God in the right place, everything else would then be in its right place. But when God's not in his right place, nothing's in its right place. Everything's out of order in your life. Oh, preacher, I can't figure out why I have chaos. Where's God in your life? That'd be the first question I'd ask somebody. Well, my life is falling apart and my life is full of chaos and I can't. Where's God in your life? Well, when I get time, I squeeze God in. Well, that's probably why your life's a mess. Maybe you ought to give God first place in your life. You say, is that going to make my life perfect? No, Jeremiah's going to teach us very, very contrary to that. This nation's a mess. Josiah's now gone and now we have uh, a, a wicked king, he's not good. His son takes the throne. Uh, next generation, he's three months, he's taken captive. Jeremiah is now about 40, 41. At this time, Daniel is 20 years old. Ezekiel, they say, uh, is about 14 years old. And then we come to this portion of Scripture. 
This is when the writing, the things that he has been preaching for about 25 years, are about to come to pass. He's been warning the nation of Israel that if you do not turn back to God, you're going to go into captivity. If you don't get your eyes back on God and start living for Him, this thing is not going to last and we're going to be in a mess. He even names the nations that are going to come against him or come against them. Within six years of that sermon, the city is overthrown because they wouldn't listen to God's man. Second Chronicles chapter number 36, you can read it later. It says they would not listen to Jeremiah and now the city is overthrown. And I wish we'd have more men of God that would stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. And I'll do my dead level best. I'm not perfect, and I'm extremely far from perfect. But I promise you that if things don't uh, uh, turn around and shape up and the Lord doesn't come back and this thing goes the other direction, I just want to put you on notice that I've tried my best and I'll continue to try my best to preach, thus saith the Lord. And so that when this thing is all, and it's all messed up, you'll not look back and say, well, our preacher never warned us. He never told us what the Bible said. I'm putting you on notice that I try my best to tell you what the Bible says and what we ought to do, and that we ought to live right and walk right and do right and stay away from some things and draw nigh to God and resist the devil and live for the Lord because it's worth it, because it's not going to get easier. It's going to get harder, and we just got to stay the course. And just like Jeremiah, I dare say that many a preacher, someday, if America goes the other direction and we're headed tonight, and if things go the other way and we end up in captivity, now it will be said, that preacher warned us just like it did about Jeremiah. Jeremiah has warned and they've not listened. Jeremiah is believed. If you'll study the Bible, you will find, and I read this just this afternoon, it's it's a great story, I... I might have preached it here, and if I haven't, maybe I will. The people come to Jeremiah, and they ask Jeremiah uh, in the latter parts of the book of Jeremiah, the the people, the the remnant that are left there after captivity and kings and and other things, and many are dead, and uh, they come to Jeremiah, and they say, Jeremiah, would would you talk to the Lord and find out if the Lord wants us to stay here or go down to Egypt? Jeremiah says to those people, please listen, Jeremiah says to those people, now listen, I'm going to go and talk to the Lord because you've asked me to talk to the Lord, but just know that whatever answer I give you, you'll listen to it, right? Oh yeah, Jeremiah, we'll listen. That's always the story. Would you be willing to do this for me? I mean, would you go to the Lord on my behalf uh, and so that the Lord will help me through this situation? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll go to the Lord on your behalf. But just know there's going to be an obligation on your part uh, with the way that the Lord answers that. Yeah, no problem. Hey, I'm going to live for the Lord if he'll just get me through this. Lord gets them through that, and you don't see uh, hide nor hair of them. Why is that? Why is that? And crises comes again, and crises comes again, and... And, uh, and so here's a group of people, same group. Boy, they've been living for, for centuries. Brother Hawk, they've been around forever. Jeremiah comes back to them and says, Lord said, don't go down to Egypt because he said there's going to be pestilence. You're going to die by famine, by the sword, by pestilence if you go down to Egypt. And they said, you're lying. God didn't say that. This is the same prophet that said that if you don't turn back to God, we're going to go into captivity. And they've ended up in captivity. This is the same prophet. But he's a liar. I mean, this is God's man that's been preaching for uh, probably 30 plus years at this point in his ministry. Everything he has said by way of prophet, by, by prophecy has come true. You don't know what you're talking about, Jeremiah. And so they would go down to Egypt, and everything that Jeremiah said would come to pass, and they would die in the land of Egypt. That's a type of the world. The world does not hold the key to your survival through this time. God holds the key. We stay where God tells us to stay. Not the place that maybe seems convenient, not the place that maybe seems comfortable. We stay and we do what God has us to do. But here's the sad fact as the story ends concerning Jeremiah and the sermon that he was preaching when it said that he heard this, this man in verse number one, Pasher, 
heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. He prophesied they would be overthrown. And it is said, many believe that Jeremiah is stoned to death by his own people, by the Jewish nation, while he is living in Egypt where they have drugged him too. And history says that he would die there at 80 years old at the hands of his own people. Because they were angry because what Jeremiah had said to them was coming true, and they blamed the preacher. They blamed the prophet for the problem instead of themselves. Isn't that interesting? Well, Jeremiah, we're in this problem because of you. Jeremiah said, you're not in this problem because of me. You're in this problem because of you. I told you not to do this. No, it's your fault. It's my fault. And eventually they took him out and stoned him to death. 80-year-old prophet has been preaching 60 years. Many also believe that uh, that's where the Bible is talking about in the book of Hebrews, where uh, it's talking about the great, uh, uh, in Hebrews chapter number 11, the great uh, hall of faith there. Uh, many were stoned, and that, they say that that is uh, probably talking about Jeremiah. The problem that I want you to see that he is about to face was because of his stand and his preaching. They were having a hard time discrediting the man. Jeremiah, but they would try to discredit the message, so they would demean the message, so that would silence the man. Make sense? They tried to discredit Jeremiah, and they found that's not working. What Jeremiah says comes to pass, and so here's what's going to happen. He faithfully preaches to them and prophesies to them exactly what's going to take place, and now we have a fellow that comes on the scene, and you, could, you would see here in the scriptures <coughs> up to this point in his life that he's been preaching God's message, and now here comes a fellow and he wants to silence God's message, God's messenger. But he says, I can't stop the message because the message came from there, but if I can demean the messenger, I will take away from his message. And I want you to see not only the sermon of verse number two, but look at the smiting of verse, I'm sorry, the sermon of verse number one, the smiting of verse number two. Then Pastor smote Jeremiah the prophet. Mm. Wow. Do you know who Pastor was? Your Bible tells you who he is. It says he was the chief governor in the house of the Lord. He was, he was the son of a priest, Brother Dan. I'll give you a terminology gets thrown around a lot nowadays. Leader. He was in leadership. He was a leader. He was one of the big dogs. He was one of the guys on the top. His dad was priest. Isn't that what the Bible says? Pastor, the son of Immer, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord. This man, Pasher, was the deputy for his father. He was a man in leadership, and not only was he in leadership, he was in religious office leadership. He was one of the good guys. He was a Christian. It's the same crowd, by the way, that crucified Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says, though, right here. This man, this you don't seem to be getting this tonight. I better bring it right on down to 2015. He was a church member. He was a prominent church member. Oh, he sat on the church board. That's what this guy would be. He was in leadership position. The man of God preaches the message, and he goes over to him, and he doesn't give him a love, love tap. But that word smote him literally means physically slapped him to cause physical pain to his body. This is the man of God. Now listen, if I'm in God's stead and somebody does that to one of my guys, that would have been the last time he ever would have moved that arm or any other part of his body. Because I'd, I'd have knocked him dead right there. God didn't do that. Because there's a bigger lesson there that God's trying to teach. And the lesson that he's trying to teach is a lesson to Jeremiah. 
So now, you see the smiting, look at the stocks in the scripture. Not only has it been hit by someone uh, uh, in a position uh, of power, uh, but uh, you would find here that uh, I, put, I put in my notes here that just because this man had clout did not mean Brother Jeff he had character. I better repeat that. Just because he had clout doesn't mean he has character. Just because somebody's in leadership, just because somebody has position, don't mean they've got any character. As a matter of fact, a lot of people that hold office, some type of office, usually don't have any character. And I'm not talking about what the White House, in case you think that's the direction I'm going, even though that's a good direction to go. Just because you've got a title, just because you've got a name, just because you have status, just because, just because, just because does not mean you have character. Some do. Many don't. Position didn't give him character. He was a characterless man who didn't want to hear the word of God, thought he, thought he would shut him up. Look at the stocks of verse number two. And they put him in the stocks that were in the high place of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. These would be stocks exactly like you're thinking about. Head and arms in the stocks. Look at the shame. Not only did we see the sermon and the smiting in the stocks, but look at the shame. Did you notice where they put Jeremiah? Oh, they put him back in a corner somewhere. They put him in the, in the prison over here. No, the Bible says that uh, if it were this property, they put him next to the front steps out there in the stocks with a bruise across his face hanging in the stocks where everybody that would come to the temple, everybody that would come to that place would walk by and they would see Jeremiah being shamed by someone who had no business doing that. They were trying to demean the man of God so that they could rob the man of God of his message. Nothing. We, we, listen, we got a society that tries to demean the man of God. There's a new television show coming out that I was talking to someone about and I had heard something about it and then I saw something about it and uh, I don't even want to tell you what the name of it is but uh, as I was watching further about the show uh, it, it has to do with a man that they call a pastor and I wish they wouldn't put that terminology on him but they did because they wanted to mean and make fun of uh, uh, the, the calling of God and and, uh, and then come to find out that it's really not his position and he's going to some town. And you say, you've watched the show, wouldn't waste my time uh, having anything to do with it. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, he goes to some town and not only, uh, but he's, he's really, he's, uh, he, he's there, uh, but he's not the person that's supposed to be there. Uh, he's an imposter. Uh, and so you can figure out the name of the show if you put pastor on there. Uh, but he's an imposter. And not only that, Brother Jeff, but... The, the guy that was coming to pastor this church, I don't know why they called him a pastor. Uh, it didn't, I don't know what the religion was. He, he had a collar on like he was a priest, but I don't think that's what the religion was. But not only was the fellow that was coming who he is taking place of, is he posing as him, but the fellow that was coming is a homosexual pastor. So now he has to play a homosexual. What? is wrong. That's what they say about pastors. That, that's messed up. Do you know what they're trying to do? Demean the man, because when I demean the man, I demean the message. See, they're all like that. You say, oh, people don't think that. People are sheeple. Sheeple. They believe anything that comes down on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox. They believe it all. Don't believe everything you see. But the world, man, we just go headlong. I mean, just following everybody else. Yep, they're, they're all the same. And if we can just demean them and dumb them down, look at how they are. And I'm sad to say, Brother Hawk, it happens uh, far too often within churches. People want to demean the man of God because they think that it gives them status. It doesn't. It doesn't give you status. You say, uh, are you talking about yourself? Uh, maybe I am talking about myself. Maybe I'm not talking about myself. Uh, uh, but I promise you, I have a lot of pastor friends, and I stand by my pastor friends. They're not all like me. They don't all preach like me. They don't all act like me. 
They definitely don't dress like me, because I dress better than all of them losers. Uh, but, I mean, <laughs> and I love them, and I'm trying to help some of them. But, uh, I mean, they're not like me at all. But they are men of God that open the Word of God and stand in the place of God and say, Thus saith the Lord. And I stand by that message, and I say, Preach on, preach on. Don't let anybody demean you. Man, if they demean you, run them out. Because that's the man of God. And he has a message. But we want to demean the man. And the second that you demean the man. See, I might as well say it. When you do it to your kids, you take away the message and you wonder why your kids are a wreck. It's because you've demeaned the man of God. Amen, preacher. That's solid preaching right there. That'll preach all over the country. You have demeaned every man of God that you've ever come in contact with. And then you wonder, I don't know why my kids are living for the devil. Well, who should they live for? You've made fun of the man of God. That means his message is a joke. Amen. You see the shame wasn't private. It was a public attack. They always attack publicly. Look at the sentence at verses 3 through 6. So it's about to come back on him, Brother Jeff, and it ain't going to be pretty. Because the very next day after he has hit him and put him in the stocks, he's pulled him out, and now he's brought him before him, and he's basically doing this. What have you got to say for yourself now? And he's going to say this. I love it. Came to pass on the morrow, verse number three, the pastor brought forth Jeremiah out of the stocks and said, Jeremiah unto him, the Lord hath not called thy name pastor, but Magor Misabib. That's a big name. Do you know what that means? That name means fear on every side. He said, everywhere around you is going to be a dangerous place to be. Fear on every side around you. Names are so important in the scripture. He just changed that man's name to fear on every side. He said, a lot of bad mojo is going to follow you. I don't know, there ain't no such thing. But he said, a lot of bad is going to be on your heels. And look at what he said. Here it is. Still the man of God, for thus saith the Lord. Hey, you may hit me, and you may lock me up, and you may try to shame me, and you may try to mock me, and you may try to make fun of me, but you listen to my message, sir. Thus saith the Lord. Did you read my lips? Thus saith the Lord. Jeremiah didn't say it. I didn't say it. He said it came from God. Take it up with him. And then he levels that man. He levels him in the scripture. I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends. He said, you're going to go down, and he said, you're going to take everyone with you. He said, you're going to take your family, you're going to take your friends, and everyone around you is going to go down because they're following you, and you're as wicked as the devil. That's what he said to him. That's stout preaching. And in case you didn't know it, every single thing that he said came true to that man. And everybody that followed his pernicious ways, as the Bible would talk about, is going to find themselves in trouble. And he goes on and is going to destroy his family. And Babylon is going to, they're going to get carried away to Babylon. In verse number six, and thou, Pasher, and all that dwell in thine house shall go into captivity, and thou shalt come to Babylon, and there thou shalt die. He said, you'll not even die, Brother Dan, in your own home country. You're going to die in a foreign land, in bondage, and stocks. I mean, locked up. He said, you may have shamed me. You may have hit me, and you may have made fun of me. But he said, you're the one that's going to go down to Babylon, and you're going to die there, and they're going to bury you there. You're not even going to be able to use the grave site that you bought for yourself down the road. Boy, that, that shot him up. Now, how many of you think at that point, man, Jeremiah, wow. But here's what happens. Suddenly, the story completely changes after this great man of God has gone through this trial. The sentence, after spending all night in this condition, it's a specific message, and it will cost many people their lives but in verses 7 through the rest of this chapter, here's the sort of the closing thought here. There's a struggle. There's a struggle that's going to take place within Jeremiah. I want you to see a struggle. Verse number 7, here's his complaint. Verse 7 and 8. O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed, and I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. There is, I'll break it up into two different pieces here. Number one, he says, Lord, there's deception. You've deceived me. Jeremiah, do you realize what you just said to that man? 
I mean, you preached him a message. Do you realize that you've been preaching through this whole text? Do you realize that you've been preaching for uh, probably 16, 18, 19, 20 years? I mean, you have got to have a walk with the Lord right now. But now, wait a minute. You've been hit across the face. You've been shamed and locked up and made fun of. And uh, really, uh, people are turning against you. Do you know if you studied the book of Jeremiah, you would find his own family made fun of him? His own family wanted nothing to do with him. I mean, this man had it, had it rough. And yet he says, Lord, you deceived me. But here's the thing. God never deceived him. Go back to Jeremiah chapter number one and let me show you. God never deceived him. Because look what God's going to say to him in Jeremiah one when he calls him in verse number eight. He says, be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee, saith the Lord. Look at, uh, well, let's keep reading. The, uh, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. See, I have this day set thee over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. Go over to uh, verse number 17. Therefore, I mean, sorry, sorry, verse number 17. Thou therefore gird up thy loins and arise and speak unto them all that I command thee. Be not dismayed at their faces. <laughs> you know, I just say to all the young preachers in the room, take that advice. Several times he said, don't be dismayed at faces. I learned uh, uh, it's too late in my ministry, stop looking at people. Because here's what I get. How's it feel? What do you guys think of that? I don't, I don't think you're thinking anything. I, I preach to people, I, I don't think anything's crossing their mind. You know what they've done? Shut down. I'm in church. Shut down. You know how I know that? Brother Hawk, we're really good at it when our wives are talking to us. Don't tell my wife. Yeah, don't nod your head. Here's your wife. She's talking to you about their day, and she's doing this, and, you, and, and you're doing just like your preacher does. And please pray for me. I am working on this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Right, Brother Raby? Would you nod your head? And God bless you, sir. I couldn't count on Brother Jeff, but I knew I could count on you. His wife's looking at him right now, and you're going to pay for that, but that's all right. God bless you. We're both paying tonight. That's all right. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Now, let's fast forward. <laughs> A week later. Don't you remember when I told you that? Uh-uh. But we had a conversation. No, we did not. We sure did. You were sitting right there. You had this on, you were wearing a black shirt, blue jeans, your socks had a yellow stripe on them, you were wearing your shoes, you were sitting right there, you had your hand crossed like, I'm like, what? You remember all of that? Yes, and we had that conversation. No, we didn't. But you know, that's what people do. Preachers preaching, I've heard it all before. I've heard them preach about Jeremiah chapter number 20. I don't need to hear it. It ain't for me. I'm in good shape. Bless God, I'm getting it in other places. I don't need it from church. Blank. Hey, young preachers, be not dismayed at their faces. Matter of fact, when they look at you like that, I would go right in front of their pew, and as Dr. John Hamlin says, just preach right up their nose hole <laughs> and spit in their face a little bit. That'll pull them out of the shock. You know, it's like getting zapped with the zappers. But he said, don't, but now, <laughs> and I'm saying all that jokingly, but even though I've done that to a few people. But uh, uh, imagine, here's what he's saying. He said, you deceived me, but wait a minute. Why? If, if, I, if he was deceived, Brother Jeff, why did God say, don't be dismayed at their faces? He's trying to give him a little lead in that he's going to have problems. People are going to be critical. People are going to look at him funny. People are going to act funny towards him. Uh, even if you don't like the preaching, act interested in the preaching. Uh, it, it'll make the service go a lot better, all right? Uh, but, but look at verse number 19. For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and a brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. Now, right there, he said they're going to be against you. 20 chapters later, Brother Danny said, you deceived me, God. Now, I don't think that Jeremiah, and by the way, he was a great prophet. I don't think he was being disrespectful with God. If you ever go through some point in your life that Jeremiah was going through right here, where it feels like everybody's against you, you would say some things to God too, not in a disrespectful manner, 
but it's called pouring out your complaint, and David did it. You know, I know you don't think that God knows what you're thinking and what you're going through and what you feel, but he does because he knows everything. And, and sometimes you might just want to tell him, hey, this is what I'm thinking. And he says, I know. He said, you deceived me, God. And he said, and here's the dumb thing. I was deceived. He said, you deceived me, and I was duped into it. I should have never signed up for the gospel ministry. <laughs> I should have said no. And when you said, uh, I'll fill you with the Spirit, I should have said, no thanks. I'm good. But he said there was deception, but he wasn't promised that. Persecutors may cause us to say some things we may not normally say. You know, persecution will cause that in your life. When people are against you, you will say some things. When the world is against you and when problems come in your life, I'm... I'm not just talking about that they were saying things against them, but when problems come in your life and life just seems to mount on you and the burden becomes heavy, you're going to find yourself sometimes saying something that you wouldn't normally say. I'm not saying that that's all right to do that. You better be mindful of who you say it to and how you say it. I would never talk to God disrespectfully, nor would I talk to anybody else that is working on behalf of God in a disrespectful manner. But you just find that there. And then he says deception and derision. The word derision literally means lap, the, a laughing stock. The word derision means just they laughed at him. They made fun of him. They made fun of the prophet of God. He was mocked and made fun of for his message. I could show you about 14 passages of Scripture leading up to chapter 18 from chapter 2 to chapter 18 where they made fun of his message and they made fun of the man of God and laughed and mocked at him and look at where it leads him I said there was a struggle and here's what he says look at verse number nine then I said I will not make mention of him nor speak anymore in his name here's his ceasing here's his ceasing two things that he said right here you know what he said he said, I will not make mention of him. You know what he said? He said, I'll not witness for him anymore. In our vernacular as Christians, I'll not be a soul winner anymore. Isn't that what he said? I'll not speak on his behalf. I'll not tell others about Jesus. You say, preacher, this is Jeremiah. I know. This is Jeremiah. And he said, I'll not witness for you. And here's furthermore. He said, nor speak anymore. He said, I'll not make mention of him, nor speak anymore in his name. He said, not only will I not witness for you, I'll not work for you. And he said, God, here's my resignation. I'm no longer preaching to those wicked people. I'm no longer doing your work. I'm no longer telling others how good you are. He said, that's it. I'm not doing it anymore. But you have to see his ceasing and then look at his condition of verse number nine. But the divine conjunction of the Bible is a wonderful thing. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. I called it no strange fire because here's his condition. He's got a strange condition going on that a lot of people suffer with nowadays. He's got heartburn. You know what the Bible says? His word in my heart was as a burning fire. He's got a heartburn condition, and here's what he says. He said, what is it that caused it? Number one, the word. Oh, I like it. I, I'm all preached out for the day. I've preached more than 40 times this year, and so that's beyond how much I should have to preach, according to the poll that was just recently out. Matter of fact, I preached more than 40 times in the last 10 weeks, so I'm pretty much spent. I can't. But I'd really love to jump on the Lord's Supper table right about here and say it was the Word. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And they were sweet. That's what Job said. The Word of Psalm 18.30 and Psalm 33.4 and 56.4 and 56.10 and 119.9 and 135 and Titus 1.3 and 1 John 2.5. He did not say, 
no, uh, 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 you know what? I was ready to throw in the towel. I was ready to do this. I was ready to do that. And the preacher, he didn't say, I was ready to do this, and I was ready to do that, and I was ready to do this, and I was ready to quit on God, and so and so. He didn't say any of that. You know what he said? He said, the word. You wonder why your preacher gets up and preaches so hard about that King James Bible right there? The word of God as I believe to be for the English-speaking people, preserved, inspired for you and I, infallible and perfect, living, breathing word of God for you and I. And you wonder, boy, preacher, you harp on that a lot. Yeah, well, if you get it down in your heart, when you reach the point that Jeremiah reached, if it was in your heart, that word, maybe it would be burning in your heart too. The Word was there, His condition. The Word, the whereabouts in His heart. Thy Word have I hid where? In my heart. That's really who you are, not in your head. There needs to be a transfer from head to heart. That's why you need to be a student of the Word of God. You've got to get in that book. I didn't say you need to memorize chapter upon chapter upon chapter upon chapter. You can memorize that stuff, and much uh, study is a weariness to the body. Uh, but listen, uh, you might not know much, but if you'll know it here instead of here, you'll be a lot further ahead than the guy that knows a lot of stuff up here. I know a lot of people know a lot of stuff up here. I know people that have been raised in church, and they could probably uh, uh, quote more books of the Bible because uh, they know uh, more chapters of the Bible. Well, I'm really impressed with that, but they ain't living for God. I'm not real impressed with that. They have it here, but they don't have it here. And there is something about knowledge in your heart. There is something about taking those things that you learn underneath teaching, underneath preaching, underneath the Word of God, and making the application to your heart, and it gets down in you, because when the rough times come, hey, listen, it's going to be the Word that's going to help you, because it is living and breathing. It's from God. And He's given it to us. So you see the Word, the whereabouts, the warmth, I like that. It was a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was reminded of the two uh, the disciples as they walked on the road to Emmaus. You know what they said? Did not our heads burn? Did not our stomachs? Did not our arms burn? They said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us in the way, while he expounded to us the Scripture? See, this is what carries the power. We need to realize that. This is it. Jeremiah said, Thus saith the Lord, and this word came from Brother Eric. He may have been the messenger, but you just mark it down. The messenger got the message from God, and any man that's walking with God nowadays that gets up and delivers a message, as long as that message is from God, you may have a hard time swallowing it, but it really doesn't matter as long as it's thus saith the Lord. We better learn how to swallow those things and then start to get that in our heart and let it warm us. And he said, and those disciples, uh, as they're walking with Jesus, said, Bar hearts burn within us. And Jeremiah said, that was it. I threw in the towel. I said, I'm not going to witness. I'm not going to work. I'm not going to do anything. He said, but as I was sitting there, and as I was frustrated, and as I was angry after that message, and he said, as, as I sat there, he said, all of a sudden, the word of God, it was just in me. And he said, I couldn't hold it. And that's where you see the last thing is the withholding. He said, I couldn't forbear anymore. And he said, I just put my hands to my mouth, and I just said, thus saith the Lord. He said, I just had to get it out. I couldn't hold it in anymore. Man, if we'd get a little bit more of the Word of God in us, maybe we wouldn't be able to hold it in anymore. Talk about baseball, football, hockey, everything else under the sun, this car, that car, this, that, and the other thing going on. Never once mentioned anything about God's Word. Never once. It doesn't cross our lips. Not from Sunday to Sunday and sometimes not on Sunday. It doesn't cross our lips. You want to know why? It's not here. You get God's Word here, it's going to come out here. That's a Bible principle. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I'm not that spiritual, but man, I'll be talking to people, and I'll, I, I may not always verbalize it to somebody. But sometimes I'll, I'll begin to have spiritual thinking start going on. I'll begin to think about this scripture verse would apply, and this scripture verse would apply. And, uh, and you know, I'm not that spiritual, but we should do that. It's called just being in the Word of God. You don't have to read the Bible 37 hours a day. 
But we really need God's Word. you want to know why? Someday you're going to want to quit. Someday it's going to get tough. And someday the, the problems are going to mount. And I wish we could go through the rest of this chapter, but here's what you're going to find. Uh, I told you there was a struggle in Jeremiah. Do you know what? Jeremiah struggled with the same thing you struggle with tonight. It's called the flesh and the spirit. And he struggled with it, Brother Dan, just like you and I do. Because he said, he preaches the message. Then he said, you deceived me. Then he said, but the word was in me. And it was like a burning fire. And then for the next two verses, man, he just unleashes and says how great God is. Do you know what he says in the next four or five verses? He said, I wish that I had never been born. Just like Job. As a matter of fact, he didn't stop there. He said, I wish that I had died in my mother's womb. I wish that the man that went and told my dad that it was a man-child would have went and told my dad that I was dead, that I had died, that it was a stillbirth. I'm not making fun of it. That's what he said. You know what he was doing? struggling just like you man he was walking in the spirit he was walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit and he said man this is hard yeah it's hard be not dismayed at their faces get God's word in you by the way Jeremiah would go on from that place to do great things for God he didn't stop preaching the message but I wanted to show you tonight the only person that Jeremiah had to blame for the condition that he was in wasn't the people it was himself and the only person that could pull Jeremiah out of that ditch was the Lord Jesus Christ, David, uh, or God the Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ, David, said, I encouraged myself in the Lord. We look to everybody and everything, and when we don't get it, we become a failure, and we blame all of those things, and there once have we done what we should do to get close to God. It does not say, draw close to so-and-so. It says, draw nigh to God. I'm all for being close to people. But we put too much stock in that, and we forget that we need to put stock in the Word. We need the Word. Get in that Bible. See what God has for you. Get it so far in your heart that it's a burning fire. That doesn't mean we don't change stations in life and change different things. I'm talking about those that are not in the race tonight. I'm talking about Christians that I know that are sitting on the sidelines doing nothing for the cause of Christ at the Calvary Baptist Church. They're sitting. They're not accomplishing anything. They're not taking responsibility and they're blaming everybody else for that condition. Get up and serve the Lord. Get a fire down in you. Go witness and work and turn the world upside down because we can make a difference. It's going to take this. Amen. Father, help us tonight. We see in the life of Jeremiah, there was no strange fire, Lord. He had the right.